introducing the Dwarf Mini. It's advertised as the little brother to the Dwarf 3, but you're going to find there's so much more than it just being a little brother. Welcome to SETI Astro. So this little guy, me and a handful of testers had the privilege of uh, doing a bunch of testing on, the, on just a handful of prototypes uh, before their production runs. I couldn't be more blown away by this little, this little robotic telescope. So let's get into unboxing, imaging with it, and some really cool statistics that I think may pique your interest in the, uh, in the Dwarf Mini. A little disclaimer up front, uh, this is a prototype unit that I have, so your packaging may be different uh, with the actual production models. Look what just showed up. Let's get it open. We have an instruction manual here. We'll look at that later. Cleaning cloth. And here's the Dwarf Mini. Oh my gosh, it's so, it's so small. <laughs> USB-C connections. And this is the solar cover for it. There's no, um, no good carrying case for it though. So you're going to have to um, keep this well protected. Let's get it charged up and turned on. All right, let's get it turned on. Let's get it connected to my phone. All right, let's connect it to the Dwarf Labs app. Hey, and I think we're uh, we're th I think we're up and running. So let's uh, get this outside and take it for a little spin. Well, here's the app. Focus it on this uh, faraway tree out here. Yeah, looks looks good. Nice little nice little mini scope here. Let's put on the solar filter and uh, look at the sun quick. There we go, we got a nice focus going on. Let's see if we could do a video. And we'll video the sun here. Turned on the solar tracking to see how well it would track the sun and it, it does just an amazing job doing the uh, solar and lunar tracking for sure. So tracking on the sun and recording the sun worked beautifully so let's get it set up for some nighttime shots and take some longer exposures with the Dwarf Mini. And I really love how versatile the Dwarf tripod is where I could extend that one leg a little bit further and it, it just props it perfectly for doing uh, equatorial mode. So to do the initial equatorial alignment, uh, I just pointed to some random spot in the sky directly overhead and uh, it works beautifully. All right, you're gonna press those three little buttons off there and click EQ mode to do the setup. And it just walks you through the normal ways of doing the equatorial alignment just like the Dwarf 3. It'll calibrate to the stars and tell you how to rotate your telescope to achieve better polar alignment. And when you've made your adjustments just click next. And it'll go through some more calibration steps and if you have great alignment it'll, it'll tell you and you can fine-tune it from there. Uh, again it'll tell you to, how to rotate the telescope in which directions and then you'll just uh, click next again and it'll verify that you've uh, achieved your perfect alignment. From there we can go right into the atlas and start exploring the night sky. Uh, so it's just a matter of finding a good target that you want to start imaging. And I chose the, the wizard here. It'll give you some instructions and it'll set up its uh, calibrating and do its go-to alignment and, and all that. 
you're going to want to unclick auto parameter and set your own parameters. And I'm choosing to do 120 second exposures at a gain of 60. And we'll get into the 120 second exposure since I don't think a lot of robotic telescopes can do that yet. And you could also run autofocus and it focuses on the stars really well. And after autofocus is done, I just like pulling up the parameters one last time, make sure it's uh, set to everything I want. And then you can just click uh, start, click the red little button there, and it's going to go through its initialization and start taking your start taking your data. I have it sped up here. I had, again, 120 second exposures, and it's just going to start running and collecting its data and stacking them live for you. Now, you may be wondering how 120 second exposures are actually tracking and they are tracking very well in the Dwarf Mini. And I think that's a, a, a big bump up from some other robotic telescopes out there that can't do 120 second exposures. And we could actually run metrics on them and see actually, you know, just how much variation there is in the, in the stars. But just looking at them, you know, there's no, there's no streaking or big, you know, misguided subs. So let's go ahead and run uh, show metrics and then just look at the stellar profiles for the 120 second exposures. And here's all the metrics for the 120 second exposures. You'd see a nice tight grouping in the full width half max. So that wasn't uh, shifted around with tracking or anything. Maybe, maybe one slightly off. Uh, same with the eccentricity there. Star count stayed consistent the whole night for me. Only at uh, when we start getting to dawn did I you know, have some issues with that. So out of all the frames, uh, as far as tracking goes, maybe two, <laughs> two weren't good. Uh, out of 184, 120 second exposures, that's pretty darn good tracking. The other thing that I noticed when I was starting to process the images, uh, the Dwarf Mini images were just easier to process. The noise seemed lower. so. That had me do a little little bit of a deep dive in comparison between the sensors. And so the Dwarf 3 has the IMX678, Dwarf Mini has the IMX662. So the Mini has 2.9 micrometer pixels versus 2. So they're, they're bigger pixels. And the sensor has a higher quantum efficiency uh, peak as well. So bigger pixels inherently are less noisy and higher quantum efficiency was great and then I did um, some quick stats on my master darks that I had taken so these are 60 second gain 60 and I did 64 images of each create master darks that way and you could look at the stats for the darks the standard deviation in the MAD which is going to tell you how noisy the dark is right the spread of the the data in the dark itself it's just smaller for the mini there is less inherent noise in the sensors for the for the dwarf mini which when i was starting to process the images it just means your snr is going to be a little bit higher you're going to have an easier time processing your image slightly bigger pixels also mean that your resolution isn't quite as high but two micrometer pixels are real tiny because of that your overall field of view between the two telescopes as well it's about the same for the Mini, it is a little smaller of a field of view, but man, it was just so much nicer to process the Dwarf Mini images because of the SNR. I mean, that's, that's what it boiled down to. Another real nicety about the Dwarf Mini is you don't need uh, to be able to see the, the north or south pole to do the polar alignment. Uh, for the first image here of the Helix Nebula, I was on the south side of my house, and the house is blocking all of the north. And um, you could you could just manually manipulate this as well, point it, uh, get it roughly polar aligned, and just point it to a clear patch of the sky for you, and get it uh, get it doing its polar alignment. You don't have to have a view of uh, the North Pole at all to do your uh, equatorial mode polar alignment. So the first image I took was that of the helix. I, I thought it was going to be a good little target here for the dwarf mini. It was in the southern sky. Uh, I'll, 
I, I, I really didn't get a lot of exposure on it. Uh, just a few hours as a first initial test. And then uh, shot M13. I figured that'd be a good test to look at resolving power in a like a globular cluster because you want uh, you know little pinpricks of light uh, and not just one big smooshy mess. So I thought this did an excellent job here with M13. I also did a test on the Crescent Nebula. Uh, this was only about uh, six hours worth of data, so not not too terribly deep, but just wanted to see if I can get a lot of that other nebulous structure that's actually around uh, the crescent, which I thought it picked up very well as well. Next target here, I was really impressed with the dust that's actually in the image, along with the emission nebula itself. So really, really great little job with the dwarf mini here. Now I think I'm just going to let the rest of the images speak for themselves. So, so what can I say? I'm really impressed with this little guy. Uh, I'm really excited that I was part of the uh, prototype testing group uh, to, you know, really showcase what it can, what it can do. Links in the description below. If you do decide you want to uh, purchase your own, uh, be sure to use my link. It'll help uh, the channel out immensely. And be sure to hop over on my Discord, uh, especially if you get the the dwarf mini. I'd love to see. Uh, what images you end up taking with it none of my stuff was very deep exposures you know just a, a night's worth of data so i know a lot of you guys are really dedicated with these robot uh, telescopes and you want to spend uh, many nights getting thousands of images and i think this would be the perfect little tool to uh, do it or if you're new to the hobby what a great little what a great little starter telescope here as always comment like and subscribe